my mindset was was not where it needed to be nor where it is today in that uh you know I, i'm not infinitely wealthy so i can only go as fast as i can create force appreciation refi and ultimately go and buy something else which i i did for the first year and a half of my full-time career and then realized that uh, there were lots and lots of people around me who would love to get into this business. Just If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money because the money comes first. Now, here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, your host of the show. And this is where we talk about raising private money for your real estate deals without ever having to ask for money. We're going to peel that back and show you exactly how we do it. And we're going to do it with a very special guest that's joining me today. He is a seasoned real estate investor, and he himself has already raised over $10 million in his real estate or for his real estate business. So with over a decade of experience, he built a portfolio of multifamily properties. So as you know, I focus on single family. Our guest today has raised private money for multifamily. So you got it covered on both ends. So for 24 years, my friend and guest, he worked for Silicon Valley startups and he was honing his skills and, you know, he was in the go-go tech world craziness. And it wasn't until 2011 that my friend actually bought his first rental property. Well, I tell you what, finally, finally in 2018, he left the rat race to focus entirely on growing his real estate business. He and I are going to be talking in this show about how we go about attracting all this money without ever having to ask anybody for money. In just a moment, you're going to meet my good friend and special guest, Mr. Ed Matthews, right after this. Well, hello, Ed, and hey, welcome to the show. Good to see you, my friend. How you been? I have been fantastic good. and so good to have you come along because I mean, man, your expertise, your experience, the journey that you have had in your real estate investing business. I mean, you've already raised $10 million in private money yourself. You've got the experience. You've got the street smart experience of actually how we go about doing this. Now, my guess is, and I don't know the answer, my guess is you and I had a similar experience. We're getting ready to find out. Okay. My experience with private money and starting to raise private <clears throat> money for my deals, I didn't start out that way. I started out full-time back in 2003. And for the first six years, I didn't know anything about private money. I never heard of self-directed IRAs. I didn't know anything about private lending. All I knew to do was go to an institutional lender a bank, commercial lender, whatever, to get funding for my deals. That's yeah. all I needed to do until January 2009 came along, <clears throat> excuse me, and I was cut off. I lost my lines of credit, had to learn about private money. Of course, it was a big blessing in disguise. I Absolutely. raised a little over $2 million in less than 90 days. So my banker did me a favor by right. cutting my lines off. So did something happen along your journey to where you didn't, you weren't using private money to start with, or did you start out your real estate journey by using private money for your funding? Yeah, it's a great question, Jay. Thanks again for having me on the show. I'm, I've been, this is one of those days where I circled the calendar. I was excited to be here. So, um, you know, in terms of where I started, I started with uh, my own money. And so I would, get a commission or get a bonus. And I'd take that money and I'd sock it away. And eventually I bought a four family and there's a story behind that, but it's, uh, it's a long one. So I'll, I'll skip over it. But the, um, 
you know, the bottom line is I realized as I was acquiring new properties, I would get a bonus, get a commission, save a little extra money, buy a multifamily. And I wasn't moving fast enough. So I actually started flipping houses as well. And so we would flip a couple houses, take the capital and go buy a uh, another multi and rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And we did that for better part of seven years. Uh, and then when I went full time, I had a, you know, a pretty decent next nest egg for my, my tech career. And I used that to start acquiring. And it, I was, my mindset was, was not where it needed to be, nor where it is today. And that, uh, you know, I, I'm not infinitely wealthy, so I can only go as fast as I can create force appreciation, refi, and ultimately go and buy something else, which I, I did for the first year and a half of my full-time career, and then realized that uh, there were lots and lots of people around me who would love to get into this business, just don't have the time because they work 40, 60, 80 plus hours a week. And this is a, a labor-intensive job. So it is uh, something that I realized that I could solve a problem for my friends, members of my family and, and their friends, and then ultimately a much larger group of people. And, and so that's when I started to get into, I changed my mindset, which I definitely want to talk about and started to raise money. So you didn't, you started out just using your own money. I did. Yeah. And it sounds like, uh, what you discovered very, very quickly was that you just can't scale really, really fast, right. you know, unless, you know, you're Warren Buffett or somebody right. and you've got, you know, no bottom to the bottom of the barrel there. Yeah. And so did I hear you correctly in saying you were attracted to raising private money so you could grow your business quicker and faster? Yeah. I, you know, I was talking with a, a former boss of mine. And he, he was asking, you know, hey, how are things going? And, you know, what's what's it like not flying all over the world and slinging software and services? And that part of it, I said, I don't miss at all. Uh, I miss the people. I don't miss the job. Right. And, um, you know, he was asking, well, how are you growing your business? And I was explaining to him that, you know, we would dip into uh, our holdings, or we would refi something after a couple of years, and we've been able to force appreciation. Or, uh, you know, I would flip a couple houses and take that capital and go buy something. He said, "Why aren't you raising money?" He goes, "You come from this business, right? You know, all I did for the first twenty-four years of my my professional career was I worked for companies that raised money from venture capitalists, and that's how that's one of the ways they grew." And it was like light dawns on marble head. I thought, well, why the heck did I not think that through? You know, part of it was a little bit of greed, right? Admittedly, I wanted 100% of the deal. Mm -hmm. But the problem was I was passing over deals because I didn't have the money to buy them. So I would catch it and, you know, I'd have to either pass or hand it off to a friend of mine. And uh, that was more painful than giving up uh, you know, 30, 60, 70% of the, uh, the deals. And, you know, I, part of the mindset shift was I would love to own 10, 20, 30% of a deal, uh, and then be able to close on all the deals I find, as opposed to just, you know, a few of the deals I find. Mm -hmm. You said a word a few minutes ago, that is probably the most important word that I've heard you say since we started our conversation and that word is mindset. Yeah. Um, so let me start the, the, let me start the conversation about mindset and how it relates to private money and attracting yep. private money. Yep. Um, but I'll let you go first. Why is mindset so important in this arena and what kind of mindset are you talking about? And then I'll tell you what I was thinking. Um, I went from thinking about, I want a hundred percent. So there's a, there's, it's a multifaceted answer, right? I went from thinking about, I want a hundred percent to, and I only get every third or fourth deal to I'll take 10, 20, 30% of, and put my own money in as well. But I also can raise 
money to, to move faster. Um, and I get all of the deals that, or I get a piece of all the deals that come across my desk. And so that was a big mind, mind, you know, a shift in my mindset. The second piece of this is that when I started raising money, I, I came at it as a technology person. Right. And so I had been in the room when, when, you know, our teams were raising millions, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars. I wasn't the guy in the front of the room. I was one of the people in the back of the room paying attention and taking notes and trying real hard to learn. And the, you know, the, the fact is, is that I learned very quickly that, or I realized quickly, once I got back into that thinking that I'm not asking for money, I'm offering an opportunity or I'm solving a problem. And once that shift occurred, then I was off to the races because I know that there are, you know, there are roughly 12 million accredited investors in the United States, a little bit more than that. And in order for me to grow my business, I need somewhere between 100 and 150 of them that are active at any given time, right? And so... I just need a teeny tiny slice of the, of that world in order to grow my business. And those hundred to 150 people or families uh, are able to then grow their business or their holdings at a rate that is a more stable and B uh, higher than what they could get in say the stock market. Right. I am, you know, part of my approach and the way I think about, raising money is I am helping people get off the roller coaster that is our stock market. I, I look at it as, as a casino and, you know, I'm walking in the door with, uh, you know, huge limitations in terms of my ability to predict where the market's going to go because there are, there are, there are wirehouses out there that are trading in the nanoseconds and I have neither the infrastructure nor the expertise to be able to outplay them. And so I'm just on for a ride. And that is not the way my brain is wired. I'm, you know, one of the things I love about real estate is it's tactile. You can go, you can touch it. You can physically change the value of it. I don't have to count on anyone else. I don't have to hope that the CEO of GE, for instance, knows what he's doing. Uh, and, you know, I, because I know what I'm doing. And so it allows me to have a lot more control. And now in raising money, I can offer that same control to other people. And that is, so I found is really valuable to those people. What you just said it is, is just so point on. Uh, one word you said uh, in what you were just talking about was you said the word solution. So I have, I have discovered and I've experienced the same exact thing as you. I talk with other real estate investors. Um, uh, some of them are new that they come to my world and they want to learn how to raise private money. And the first thing that I got to fix in their head is what we're talking about. The first thing I have to fix is first of all, they have a fear of rejection. And so I have to explain it in a way that they understand. And here's the question. How can you be rejected if you're not asking anybody for anything? And being rejected, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, being rejected is fine. You know, the, uh, uh, my, one of my mentors, one of my favorite people in the world, Pete Black guy I used to work for, uh, back in my software days, you know, he said, yes, is the best answer. No, it's the second best answer. It's maybe that's death. Right. And so I, you know, having been in sales and marketing and operations, and I got very used to hearing people say no. And that's okay, right? Because they're not saying no to you personally. You don't take it personal. They're saying no to your offer. And so the the really smart kind of next level thing that, that I've learned over the course of time is I, I take that no in. I acknowledge it. I understand it. I give it a little bit of space. And then I follow up with them and say, hey, let me ask you something. Was it a timing thing for you? Was it, uh, you know, what could I have said or done to make you more comfortable so I can learn from that. So the next time I have this opportunity, I can, you know, present it more effectively. And, you know, half, half the people will gladly take that phone call and they'll tell me, uh, you know, bad timing. 
Um, I don't believe in the project. Uh, you know, my wife didn't like you, um, whatever. Right. And that's okay. Uh, cause they said no to my offer. They didn't sort of say no to me. And, you know, when I'm ever, when I'm counseling people and like you do in terms of, you know, getting to that place in their head where they can start to raise money. Um, that's one of the key things that I need them to understand is that, you know, they're saying no to, to your offer. When you go home, your wife is still going to think you're amazing. Your kids are still going to think you're eight feet tall and your friends are still going to love you. And your life doesn't change at all when you hear no, right? All that no gives you is more time because you know not to spend any more time on that person for this particular project, right? It's maybe that is, is, is the worst answer because then you continue mm -hmm. to spend time and uh, they may or may not move forward. Um, I, I actually love no's because I actually gamify it. I go one step further and gamify it. So I know that, you know, if I talk to 20 people, usually two or three of them will say yes. And, and sometimes it's a lot more, sometimes a little less, but uh, most of the time it's usually in that, you know, 10 to 15, maybe 20%. And uh, the, you know, every time I hear a no means that I'm one step closer to that yes. Right. And I track that stuff. I have a little check pad here on my desk and I'm ticking, you know, yeses and nos because I know, you know, it's it's a silly little thing that I do, but it motivates me because I know I'm getting closer. Ed, have you by chance heard of the book Go For No? Uh, I have heard of it. I can't say I've read it. Oh, it's fantastic. It's a thin, little, teeny, tiny yeah. book. Go For No. I've got it over here on my bookshelf. I can't think of who the author is. But anyway, it sort of gamifies it. It really yeah. does. Um, but back to what we were talking about, about not asking for money It all. One thing I've learned, whether it's raising private money, doing deals, talking to sellers, talking to buyers, it doesn't matter. As long as we are focusing on serving them yes, and helping them fix a problem, right? I don't have to worry about me, right? right. But I mean, where I get in trouble is when I'm focusing on me yep. and I'm trying to talk to them and they know intuitively I'm focusing on me. So how do we fix that? Well, I've, I used to say it all the time. I now actually have a real, I used to tell people all the time, put on your teacher hat yep. and start teaching people what private money is, how they can get high rates of return safely and securely, all backed by real estate. Right. And so here's how this plays out. I have got 47 individuals, private lenders. We're not talking hard money or institutional lenders here in this conversation. I got 47 individuals that are investing in our single house, uh, in our single family houses. Excellent. And here's what's interesting, Ed. Here's what's interesting. Not one of them, of those 47 people, had ever heard of private money or private lending, didn't know what it was, didn't know what the phrase meant. They for sure had never heard of self-directed IRAs and how they can move their current retirement funds over to a company, a third-party custodian, self-directed right. IRA, right. and invest in our deals and loan us money. So what did I do? When I was cut off of the bank, I put on this teacher hat and I just started visiting with people that I go to church with in the Rotary Club in Business Networking International. And what I did was I put my program together, my private lending program that I would teach people. Well, here's my program. Here's the interest rate I pay. Here's how you can get your money back in case of an emergency. Here's the length of the note. Yep. And you know what? In my single family house realm, now this does not apply when you're raising money for syndication on large multifamily projects such as apartments. That's syndication. Everything that I do is what we call one-offs, meaning you got a private lender or maybe a couple of private lenders that are funding a single family house deal. So right. as a result, part of this that takes all the pressure off, I mean, there's no yes, there's no no. I teach the program. Well, I don't have to ask, what do you think about it? Because after all, they're not going to be listening to me teach the program either at a private lender luncheon or over coffee or whatever, yep. uh, unless they got investment capital <laughs> yeah, or, right? or retirement funds. Right. 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 And so I, I teach the program and then I shut up. It takes like 20 minutes to talk through the program, you know, as to how, how they would benefit. 
So they simply tell me how much they got to work with. You know, is it in their retirement funds? Is Do I need to introduce them to Quest Trust out of Houston to right. move their monies over so they can invest? And then here's what you're going to love this, Ed. And then when I've got a deal for them to fund, I don't call them up and tell them about the deal and ask them if they want to fund it. That's the most stupid question in the world I could ever ask them. Of course they want to fund it. I give them what's called the good news phone call. And the good news phone call goes like, hey, Ed, I got great news for you. You're one of my new private lenders in this role play. Awesome. You've already told me you got $150,000 to invest. And so you're sitting by the phone waiting for the call because I didn't have a deal for you when I first taught you the program. So I just call you up and say, Ed, I got great news for you. I can now put your money to work. Got a house in Newport with an after repaired value of 200000 The funding requires 150000 which I know you have. Closing is next Wednesday. You need to wire your funds by next Tuesday. I'll have my real estate attorney email you the wiring instructions. End of conversation. Yep. Because, I mean, particularly if they have moved their money, their retirement funds, over to a self rented IRA company, they're not making any money until you call them up and right. put their money to work. It's right. all about serving. It's not asking, begging, chasing, selling, or persuading. Yeah. In fact, if I, if I feel that, that if I'm working that muscle where I'm trying to persuade somebody, I stop because it's not the business I'm in, right? It's, uh, you know, my job is to understand where someone is or a family is, where are they trying to go? And figuring out if this project that we have coming up, for instance, is a fit to help them get a few steps closer to their ultimate goal. If it is, great. Then they get the good news phone call. Uh, and I'm going to borrow that because I don't, <laughs> I just call it a phone call, but that's okay. <laughs> that's the uh, good news phone call. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, so that's what I do is, is it's, uh, there's an old sales uh, term. I want to say Brian Tracy. I got it from Brian Tracy, but uh, it's dig your well before you're thirsty, right? Mm. And so I am like you, I'm out there educating people. I want them to understand not only, so we syndicate some of our deals, but most of our deals are, are just private lending deals uh, or occasionally there's a joint venture, um, but most of them are private lending deals. And so my focus on that is to do what you do. You, I educate them. And I do that for a couple of reasons. One, uh, I want to obviously establish that I understand, you know, I, I need to understand where they're trying to get. I want them to understand that I'm a, a um, you know, somebody that understands or, you know, is good at their job and knows what they're doing and that their money is ultimately going to be safe with us. Uh, and then the last part of it is I want to make sure that they are asking the right questions of me and otherwise, you know, I've, I've had multiple experiences where I, so we have a podcast as well um, called the, if you don't mind, I can mention it, um, the real sure. estate underground. And, you know, we have a pretty good audience, not quite as big as yours, but that we're working on it. Uh, the, um, you know, the whole idea is that we're out there educating people. I interview people and, you know, we want to drop those gold nuggets in that 30 to 40 minute time frame. And what happens is they hear, you know, the audience hears the tone, my approach, my mindset, the value system with which we operate, and they start to feel like they know me, right? And they do to a certain extent, but, um, but I've had more than one meeting where, I've met with an investor and and he or she has said, well, I don't need to ask you any questions. I've been listening to your podcast for six months. And I, my eyes go wide. Like, yes, you do. You have, you know, there are 112 questions you should be asking me literally. And I wrote a book about it um, and I give it to everybody. Right. And so the, you know, the whole idea here is that I want them to, there's, there's, you know, I, th there are people out there that, say they're good at their job, but eh, not quite. Um, and so, you know, you've got as an investor, you've got to run them through a vetting cycle so that you understand that, you know, th that they know what they're doing from an operator perspective. They know what, you know, they know how money works, right? 
Uh, they also, you know, you got to look at the deal. You got to look at the market. You got to break it all down. You have to understand how you get your money back. You have to understand when you get paid. You have to understand all of that. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't think you should do that in just a, an offering memorandum and a, you know, and an operating agreement. I think you need to actually have a human being to human being conversation and let me explain it to you. Like you're a, you know, a ninth grader. Um, cause that is how you grow. And it's also how you make good decisions on the investments that you make. Absolutely. Speaking of books, um, I know that you are now launching a new book. Uh, tell everybody about this new book and how they can get it. So when I meet with real estate, aspiring real estate investors, I, I always ask them, you know, Hey, have you gotten started yet? And it, some of them have, and the ones that haven't like, no, I, I really haven't gotten started yet. And I, I always ask them the same question, which is, well, what's stopping you? Help me understand that. Right. I, I tell people I, I live in Connecticut you know, whenever I'm at a networking event or anything like that, I always tell people I'm a cheap date. I will, you know, for, for the price of a cup of coffee, I will sit down with you for half an hour and, and shoot the breeze and answer any questions you have. And in most cases I'll buy the coffee. Right. So, um, the three problems that I tend to hear are, I don't have enough time, right? I work 60, 80 hours a week, or I work multiple jobs. I have family responsibilities. I have this, I have that. I just don't have time. Uh, second one is the one we're talking about. I don't know where to find the money, right? And then the third one is I don't know where to find the deals. And I am a marketing person by trade, sales and marketing. And so that part of it is the part that I'm very comfortable with and I'm pretty good at, right? And so I wrote a book called the um, Investor's uh, Deal Flow Playbook. Uh, and there is a trading course that actually is about to be launched that goes with it. Uh, but, you know, the idea is that there are, you know, there are a handful of constituencies that you need to know, they need to know, like, and trust you so you can earn the right to do business with them. And it's brokers and agents, it's property owners, it's wholesalers, it's property managers, and uh, and then other investors, right? Um, and so I uh, wrote uh, the first book, um, the the uh, deal flow inve or investors deal flow playbook, specifically for brokers and agents, and then there will be additional books coming out very soon on how to do it with wholesalers, how to do it with property owners, how to do it with uh, property managers, and then ultimately you know your fellow investors. And I'm I'm basically giving I, I like to call them the missile secrets, right? I'm giving you the missile secrets on exactly how Clark Street operates, how we grow. You know, if you talk to investors these days, they'll say, "Oh, there's no deals out there." That's not true. Uh, you know, we close on one or two deals a month. You know, we're not doing huge 200 unit buildings. We're buying seven units here, ten units there, fifteen units over here. Uh, but those things add up. And so I, I, you know, I want to show everybody uh, a look under the hood and, and let them know, here's how we do it. And it works really well. And you can apply it, whether you have no budget or you have a big budget. Um, there are there are specific things you can do to get that get those deals flowing. And awesome. so that's well, let's give out that website, that URL where they can get the book. And yeah, that so is the go go tell it. Uh, so that's our, our main website is clarkstreet.com, clarkst.com. And uh, to get the book, it'll be backslash ebook. So grab that book, everybody. That's www.clark, C L A R K S T for street. That street's not spelled out. So clarkst.com forward slash ebook. Be sure and grab your copy of that. I assume that's a free download. Right? It is. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Well, before I let you go, Ed, uh, answer this question. And Bet. that is when it comes to private money, uh, how and where do you like to find your private lenders? Well, that's a great question. So uh, I, I have a few ways that I do it. Uh, one is something I call the three foot rule, uh, which is if I'm, consuming oxygen uh, within three feet of another human being consuming oxygen, uh, I will strike up a conversation with them and talk to them about, 
you know, what they're excited about in their world. And invariably they ask me what that, what I'm excited about. And I tell them, well, I'm in real estate and I'm really excited about all the things that we're doing and the good we're doing. And some people ask questions. Some people go, oh, that's nice and change the subject and that's fine. Um, but the, I can't tell you how many times, and I'll tell you a story. It's actually not my story. It's a friend of mine, Chris uh, Morin's story, but he was at a uh, coffee shop in Connecticut and he was standing in line and he had a similar conversation with a gentleman that was in front of him. And turns out the, the guy that he was talking to was the CEO of one of the area uh, large insurance companies. Connecticut is the insurance capital of the world. And so all the big, all the big insurance players are here. And it just so happened, Chris was standing behind one of the CEOs and that CEO was telling him that he's been looking for a partner to deploy uh, a substantial amount of capital into the real estate market. And now that gentleman is one of Chris's largest investors. And I've had similar experiences, uh, not quite that big, but uh, where, you know, I've met people at the pharmacy or people, you know, at the coffee shop or waiting in line at, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a basketball game. Um, and a handful of them ha are now partners of mine and it's worked out great. So that's, that's one way. Uh, the other way that I do it is on social media. Um, you know, I, uh, have a pretty large following on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and growing on Twitter and YouTube. And the, you know, the whole idea there is people will reach out and ask questions. And, and I, you know, like I said, I'm a cheap date. I'm happy to answer questions. And so we create a, you know, a, a, a conversation and start to build a rapport you know, it's a very simple four-step process to, to build a relationship. Um, and it's, you know, you've got to make them aware that you're out there. So that's social media, right? I'm out there constantly. I'm not talking about uh, beating my chest and all the things that we're doing that are really wonderful. What we're doing is we're educating people. We want people to be smarter about the world that we live in, in real estate. Um, and so people will gravitate towards that content learn from it and then realize, Hey, I want to do this, but I don't have time. So Ed, do you know anybody that can help me invest money? And, you know, we are one of those entities, obviously. So that's when we have a 15 to 20 minute conversation about their goals and what they want to do and figure out, you know, in that time frame, are we a good fit? Right? So you create the knowledge that, Hey, I'm out here. You build you start building a relationship and you become friends. I mean, actual friends, like I serve them, they serve me, you know, we keep in touch, we have conversations, we go out for a beer every once in a while, we grab dinner, you know, they're actually my friends, right? And, uh, and then over the course of time, trust is built. And sometimes that can take a week and sometimes that can take three years and it doesn't matter, right? So as you build your relationships and you earn trust, Ultimately, that trust turns into the um, opportunity to, to, to do business with them. And I leave that fourth step to them. They've got to ask. I, I, don't I don't offer unless they've said somewhere along the way, hey, I want to invest with you. Um, and so it, it happens kind of naturally. And, and so that's the way I prefer to do it. Like I said earlier, if I feel like I'm persuading somebody, I, I stop talking. I, I, that's just not the way I'm wired. It's amazing, Ed, how much our core values and the way we approach this business um, is spot on exactly the same. Yeah. This was so was much excited. fun. I'd love to be on your podcast. <laughs> Count on it. I'm, I'm hoping you will. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, and we've got a viewer that is uh, actually asking a question live right now. Sure. Um, if you tell everybody again, where you are based out of and where you live. So I live in central Connecticut, uh, here in the U S and your projects are all in Connecticut or all over right now. They're all in Connecticut. Uh, we are looking at deals down in the Carolinas and in the Midwest and Indiana specifically, uh, haven't really had anything that pencils quite yet. We make our offers, but sellers are still stuck in 2021 and we're trying to live in reality here in 2023. But, <laughs> uh, you know, by and large, uh, you know, our deals, our local, uh, you know, our, our deals that we're doing on a monthly basis are here in Connecticut. Awesome. 
So there you have it, uh, my friends. Be sure and pick up Ed's new book, which is you can get at www.clark, C-L-A-R-K-S-T for street.com forward slash ebook. And of course, we'll have that in the show notes. Ed, what a blessing to have you on the show. Thank, thank you, you so much. And God bless you. Uh, thank you, Jay. It's uh, wonderful to see you and uh, have a wonderful Thanksgiving and, uh, and a very happy holidays. Merry Christmas. All right. Thank you so much. Well, there you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. So glad you decided to join us and be sure and help us out so we can have more amazing guests here on the show. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any future notifications of shows coming up. And your favorite podcast platform that you are listening to, be sure and follow me right now. I'll see you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.